you know, at least three, once in three months. But I don't live here. I live in Silicon Valley. And uh, same is the case with Faninda. He lives in Bangalore. So, you know, these things, for the sandbox model to take root and take and establish, you really need those change makers and the dreamers. And, uh, you know, I, we couldn't have been more thankful than to have the kind of quality of people right here who got things started. So just a little bit about my background, how I got started with this. Uh, I'm a tech entrepreneur, uh, went to Bitspilani and then uh, you know, went to the US uh, back in 81. Uh, you know, I uh, did my master's uh, in computer science and then joined Intel. Uh, worked there for about 10 years and uh, you know, like most people in Silicon Valley, after a while you get this sort of urge. Uh, you want to be an entrepreneur and uh, you're surrounded by a lot of great entrepreneurs. And, uh, you know, uh, and coming from an engineering background and everything else, uh, you know, I whatever I was going to do was going to be a tech entrepreneur. But the connection with India was very important to me. And that's how Sierra Atlantic got started. And we are fortunate to grow that to about 24, 2500 employees worldwide. And about five years ago, Hitachi bought my company. And, uh, you know, I uh, always was involved in some sort of non-profit activities in the Bay Area, in Silicon Valley. But, uh, you know, entrepreneurs by nature are restless people, you know, so was I. <laughs> and always looking to do something and uh, clearly everybody here, we all share a common, you know, uh, desire uh, for a better India. So I'm no different from that standpoint. But, uh, you know, each of us is shaped by our own experience and background. So to me, anything I wanted to do, Really, uh, I felt it has to scale uh, because India is a country, you know, with uh, 1.3 billion people. So unless you can touch a large population, you're not going to make a meaningful difference for a long time. And we have plenty of catch up to do. Uh, so, and uh, I was, uh, you know, fortunate to uh, run into Desh uh, uh, in the valley, introduced by a common friend about roughly about four years ago, I would say. Uh, and uh, you know he participated in a program that uh, I was driving there called Sevathon that kind of brings different non-profits together uh, to promote uh, you know uh, philanthropy in the Indian American community and uh, and took about a year after that and quickly I knew the model that Desh was sort of building in Hubli was something that uh, you know uh, looks very attractive and something that I could relate to again coming from a tech entrepreneur background so I visited Hubli a few few times and uh, clearly everything we are doing here is inspired by the work that Desh and Jayashree have been doing in the Hubli Sandbox. So please uh, give them a big hand. Uh, so very quickly, uh, there are two main aspects of the Sandbox model that uh, truly uh, sort of uh, resonated with me. One, as you have seen earlier in the day, it is a bottom-up form of socio-economic development. Meaning, unless the people in the communities, in the rural areas, unless they are a part of the solution, not just define, you know, coming up with the problems, but actually coming up with the solutions and executing those solutions, things are not going to be sustainable. So the bottom-up form of socio-economic development is one element. And the second is, uh, it brings the rigor of, uh, you know, uh, for-profit world and the entrepreneurial mindset to addressing social challenges. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, scale was very important and clearly that's what they've done in Hubli. So those in many ways to me were the basis for you know, obviously devoting my time and energy into this. And uh, you know, much like Desh, uh, I, my father also lives here, uh, you know, in Desh's case in Hubli, just a, a phenomenal, uh, you know, person indeed, uh, you know, the first person that I met in Hubli when I went there and, uh, you know, very, very inspiring and, uh, it, it, and to me that was a good anchor uh, because, you know, having somebody like that uh, who is, and some of you will get a chance uh, hopefully to meet him later in the day, but, you know, I figured uh, this is the place I want to do it. Uh, I mean, my love for India was more important than uh, you know, just Nizamabad. Obviously, as a place of birth, I do have a special attachment. Uh, but, you know, I think of myself as an Indian American first uh, and then, you know, uh, a, a native of Nizamabad. 
and uh, but uh, for all those reasons this turned out to be the right place for me to do that so in our case we picked a region that's roughly about 10 million people and as you can see over the last couple of years we have built a fairly substantial sort of critical mass of activity but uh, clearly we need partners uh, you know that are here today uh, and hopefully something here will resonate with you and uh, you know we'll uh, be you you'll con you'll be a part of our journey going forward from here so with that i would like to you know invite the two keynotes two of my favorite people uh, that are uh, truly transforming india uh, one of course coming from a tech entrepreneurship background turned philanthropist that's uh, guru raj dr guru raj desh desh pande we'll just give a big hand to him. and uh, mr jayesh ranjan uh, the it secretary for uh, india's uh, newest and youngest state uh, telangana uh, jayesh likes to call it a startup state so uh, please uh, join me in on the stage so what uh, will will try and keep this interactive so you know uh feel free to chime in with any questions comments but uh, i'll just lead it off with uh, you know a couple of questions maybe and uh, just a few words uh, about each of them uh, i think there is a, there should be the bios in the you know booklet that you have so i'm not going to necessarily read that but uh, desh is one of the most admired and respected indian americans that i know of Uh, there are a lot of people uh, of indian origin in the us that have done extremely well uh, you know as entrepreneurs as business people uh, whatever field but uh, i can't think of a single person that has been as effective as desh also in so many multiple fields uh, and now of course as a philanthropist uh, with the desh pandey foundation and uh, i don't know how many of you know but uh, you know in his uh, long career as an entrepreneur uh, he was uh, involved as a founder chairman ceo with at least three companies that uh, exited north of a billion dollars which is very very rare uh, again that just shows you it's not so much about you know how much money that is but just the scale and the ability to build institutions like that not just one twice but thrice I, frankly I, i there's certainly no other indian american that i know i don't even know if there's anybody else in the us that has done that so you know i'm just uh, so fortunate to uh, you know have him sort of be my mentor in many ways for what we have started here and no introduction of desh is really complete without talking about jayshree let's just give her a big hand she's also in the audience so she's really the spirit uh, uh, you know and the pragmatist uh, sometimes from what i gather behind uh, the desh pande foundation and uh, so we're glad to have you also here jayshree and uh, jayesh uh, we met i think first time about 4 uh, or 5 years ago when uh, jayesh came uh, as uh, part of the it delegation at that time from the combined state of andhra pradesh to silicon valley and more recently uh, just about uh, you know 9 months ago he came to silicon valley uh, representing our us state telangana uh, with the it minister mr ktr and i tell you he really made a huge impression on the people in silicon valley uh, and i really spent time with a lot of state delegations and it's not easy to impress those people uh, and just to give you specific uh, data points today microsoft facebook google amazon and uber all five of them either already have the largest development centers outside united states already have it or will soon have it in hyderabad in the state of telangana so and that's lot of the credit goes to jayesh and uh, of course the it minister so i think that kind of says a lot about uh, you know jayesh is really a things acts and you know uh, partners very much like the ceo of a company that wants to build a global uh, you know business so with that uh, uh, let me lead off with the question to uh, uh, desh so desh uh, i know you started as an entrepreneur and then uh, you know uh, you have uh, been running this sandbox in hubli for about 8 or 9 years now so what what made you start with that model and uh, also how do you see that uh, you know uh, as you the beauty of entrepreneurship 
is that it, it just opens up a lot of capabilities within you that you didn't have. So you start with a mission, something that you want to do. You have no clue how to do it. But a year later, two years later, three years later, you look back and you say, I didn't know I could do all these things. And also, the people that are with you on the journey, they feel the same way. And so, for me, that's the biggest gift anybody can have. Ability to, to take on a mission and do something and suddenly feel your own capabilities expand. And so, when we're thinking about something, of giving back uh, with the foundation, we thought the biggest gift we could give to other people is, is, that, is that feeling, is that feeling of people being a lot more capable, ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And also we thought that would be a good approach to solve problems. Uh, uh, Jayesh, uh, so uh, you've been uh, now in this role, I, I know you're also the Commissioner of Industries, uh, right, currently, and also the, as IT Secretary. And uh, so there's been a lot of talk, of course, and focus on, uh, you know, Hyderabad as a center uh, to attract more businesses, which you talked about. But specifically as it relates to the rural Telangana, how, how do you see the, you know, government working perhaps with its own programs or, you know, in partnership with initiative such as this? First of all, uh, good afternoon, fellow participants. It is uh, really amazing to be here and uh, see how successful, how potentially transformative this kind of development model is, the sandbox model. So very happy to be here and uh, listen to all the right practitioners who have uh, rich experience of taking this model of, de of development to the grassroots. Now, <coughs> to, to answer your uh, specific question, uh, Rajogar, while uh, the focus has been on Hyderabad, I, in my opinion, to start with, that kind of focus has also been necessary because Hyderabad is the jewel of the crown of the new state of Telangana. And uh, as you know, the new state has come into me after years of struggle and amidst lots of people who predicted that this will be a failed state, it will collapse right from day one, etc. So, very important to showcase Hyderabad to ensure that people outside feel that this is a credible government, this is a government which means business, to get that uh, confidence back in uh, the state of Telangana and the city of Hyderabad. So now that we have successfully done that, and you also mentioned the responses from some of the leading, uh, the, some of the marquee IT companies towards uh, towards this state. So that in a way establishes the strengths and the, fun the fact that the fundamentals of this government are very very strong. Now the focus has to move beyond Hyderabad, and it has already it has already moved. In fact, for the last. Uh, let us say the six to eight months, the state government has introduced a number of innovative programs. But eventually, the model which will emerge will be something like this. What you are trying out in Islamabad, what Desh has tried out in Mumbai, in which government will really look to people who will mobilize the community, who will bring the community together, identify ideas, identify opportunities, and then whatever is the facilitating or supportive or catalytic role that the government needs to play, that the government will play. So, in fact, one very good example, since both of you have seen that institution, which uh, we really take a lot of pride in, that is the T Hub. T Hub is precisely the example of how the government intends to work in the rural area also. My T Hub is in Hyderabad, it is a technology incubator, but the arrangement will be the same be a partnership model, government will play a facilitating role, whatever is funding, whatever infrastructure support is required, that will be done. But the basic task of bringing the community together, helping the professionals within that community lead the show, that uh, will be done. So in, in this case itself, the sandbox itself, people, what, what really uh, makes me feel so happy is people like you, Fanendra, who 
who were privileged to get education, who were privileged to move on in life, do well, have chosen to use that uh, that uh, experience, that uh, understanding to show the way to so many hundreds and thousands of people. Here. So this kind of an approach is what is going to work in, in Telangana in the future. All right, thank you. For those of you who have not uh, seen the Tea Hub, please uh, do you know, uh, check it out. Just an amazing place and in a short time, uh, they built up uh, you know, now India's largest incubator, right? Uh, startup uh, center. But very quickly, I think there's an ecosystem forming around that. And uh, yeah. So, uh, Desh, uh, I mean, you, I've heard you talk in the past about how uh, you need to have uh, innovation uh, that's relevant, relevant to the local, uh, you know, uh, issues, and uh, of course that's also the theme of our conference: uh, execute locally and innovate globally. Can you share a little bit about your experiences with that, and especially over the last eight years, uh, you know, when you got that right, when some things didn't work out, and in general, if you can expand on that aspect for the benefit of our audience. Yeah. Well, you know, I think. Um, <coughs> I find that there's no lack of compassion among the people who have done well and who have brains and who can innovate all kinds of things to help those who are not doing that well, right? But I think we need to come up with a model. And so, how many of you in the audience are from outside of Nizamabad? See, it's a large population, so none of you would have taken the trouble to come all the way here to be with us all day if you didn't have the compassion and willingness to help people. So, if, if all of you want to offer that help, either financial help, intellectual help, physical help, what is stopping from that effort actually paying off? So that's the key question. I think Fundamentally, even though people are willing to offer the help, unless you build the capacity to accept that help and absorb that help, the help doesn't do much. For example, we have a similar sandbox in, in Boston, Massachusetts. There is a part of the, the state where there is a huge unemployment, you know, things are really bad. It's a, it's a population of about 100,000 people with 3,500 gang members you know, lots of drug dealing, you know, it, it's, it's really bad. And we have all these MIT, Harvard, and all the leading educational institutions, fidelity, all kinds of wealth, all kinds of ideas, all kinds of brains. And they've been trying to help this community now for over 50 years with very little impact, right? And the reason for that is because people who have money, who have brains, they their starting point of thinking is always, this is what I have, how can I help? So when they come up with the idea themselves and then try to take it to this place, like the leading professors and non-profits, to this area, the area does not have the capacity to absorb that help that you're trying to bring, the ideas that you're trying to bring. So the idea behind the sandbox is to actually really build that capacity so that people within the community become the innovators, become the people who actually can absorb the ideas that you're trying to bring to them. So it's, it's really two things that I think we need to remember. Number one, we should, we should co-create the solution with the people that need it. Because, you know, we all know in business, unless you can come up with a product that the customer likes, it doesn't work. So people who have a very different lifestyle, when they try to think about interventions and products for the people, they try to help, and, and that's not the community they live in, the product is inappropriate. Secondly, even if you come up with an appropriate product, there's no capacity to absorb. Unlike the developed economy, where people have disposable income, you have established distribution channels. You have Flipkart, you have Snapdeal, Amazon, Walmart, Big Bazaar, all these things. So if you come up with a product or an intervention that people need, automatically that solution gets traction in the marketplace and gets distributed. So I think a way to 
innovate globally but execute locally is to build that capacity and to innovate together with the people who need that innovation. So, uh, Desh, I would like to ask a follow-up question. When we are uh, executing locally, what is the importance or role of local level leadership? For example, uh, when Krishna was speaking and his colleague was speaking, I could understand that lots of grassroots work is getting driven by very credible volunteers who are from among the community. So, how critical is their role? And since you have been doing this in Hubli for a long period of time, how do you identify these leaders? Do they emerge on their own? And what kind of effort do you really put to hone their leadership skills? And fundamentally, are they the most critical piece of this entire initiative? Yes, absolutely. I think you identified the right thing. It's, it's those change makers and the people who have the commitment and want to do it. And the subtle difference is that you know, when people do policies, they try to go top down. And in fact, that's what we did in Hubli initially when we got started. Because I and Jitri, we were away from India for over 30 years. We didn't know anybody in Hubli. So our initial concept of the sandbox was to see if we could get the best nonprofits from United States to come and see the sandbox. So when we when we said we want to do that. Every non-profit in the U.S. said, I want to go. So initially we had Ashoka Foundation, Habitat for Humanity, Health Without Harm, United Way, all kinds of people, TechnoServe, they all came to Hubli. United Way, which is, which really specializes in building a community and community leadership, everything else. So they came and spent a lot of time in Hubli and put together a board of all the existing leaders of Hubli Two years later, nothing had changed. And part of the reason was that if the existing leaders could make the change, they would have made it. So every time a young guy came up with an idea, the existing leaders would always say, no, 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 we tried it in 1967, it hasn't worked, you know. So I think in entrepreneurship, the reason why entrepreneurship works is that entrepreneurs have the ability to get into the market without the big companies blocking it. In fact, Japanese market, Japanese economy, really struggles with that because the big companies are so established that the new ideas cannot get into the marketplace at all. So we have to somehow find a way, and, and the way I found it is, we call it the opt-in process. That is, if you want to cause a cultural shift, it doesn't matter whether it's an institution or a government or big company or a community. You cannot cause a cultural shift top down. So you just have to look for maybe five people who you think can make a change. And you focus all your resources on a, a few people. Once they start showing a little bit of change, then you get from five to 50 to 500 to 5,000. At some point it, it hits a critical mass and then it becomes a part of the culture. So somehow, finding a mechanism to do this opt-in process in a lot of places, I think is a, is a challenge that we all have to work on so that you can do it across the whole state of the whole nation. Yeah. So, uh, Jayesh, uh, you've been here, uh, I guess, uh, this is what happened here. You came in last evening and uh, you've uh, met with some of the people here. And, so what's the, when you guys think about uh, rural entrepreneurs and all of that, um, is, do you see, what are the areas where we could perhaps have a stronger formal you know, engagement uh, with the government of Talangana? Yeah, in fact, uh, good that you asked this because uh, since evening I'm, uh, since yesterday evening that is, I'm, I'm thinking about it. See. <coughs> In, in the rural areas, obviously after the new state has come into being, there are expectations and very high expectations that the government will provide jobs for everyone. And uh, in fact, on our, uh, in our, on our minister's uh, Facebook page, we get lots of comments from young people from different parts of the state 
who are asking him, well, you're doing great for IT and all, but where are the jobs in the rural areas? And that has also set us thinking that obviously some number of jobs will be created, but obviously it will not be enough to satisfy everyone's uh, requirements. And obviously those who have that inclination and talent to become an entrepreneur, we need now to start looking at them. Now, when we were setting up TIHA, we also did some very deep, developed some very deep understanding on how this entire entrepreneurial ecosystem works. And if you have to really recreate it, how meticulously you have to really plan for it. And fundamentally, that model is the same. What has worked well in Hyderabad for TIHA, I'm sure can be replicated in rural areas at uh, regional level. So, for example, Islamabad can be a regional incubator and there could be one somewhere else, one in Nagur Nagar maybe. Now the <coughs> key lessons from T-Hub is that five things need to come together. Of course, you need to provide them a very good infrastructure where uh, their ideas, their creativity is really channeled, is really fostered. You also require, you also need to bring to them very top class mentors who, and, uh, and run a very structured mentoring program so that they learn from experiences, they understand the value of uh, other people's uh, journeys and paths. We also need to provide them seed funding because uh, we have seen so many other models of government supporting uh, rural entrepreneurship in, in, in different parts of the country with uh, very, very poor results that uh, enough funding, timely funding, and the kind of linkages, the kind of backstopping that was required, that was not really made. We also need to bring research into lots of science as I mean. See, for example, yesterday in the evening, some people were talking about the agriculture interventions which are happening. Now, for cotton farmers, a very interesting uh, observation was shared that till uh, recently, till, till uh, two years ago, Lots of crop used to get lost due to pest attacks and farmers would uh, spray pesticides indiscriminately to really prevent those pests. But a simple intervention of uh, planting... Menka uh, Yeah, so this Menka uh, crop madhilo waste out there. A crop I then pest sandhi parthai. Mero anosranga pesticides what calls the anosranga. So that way you really save on uh, lots of unnecessary expenditure on pesticide. So lots of science and knowledge is in there in our academic institutions that needs to come. And finally, you need to really create the first base of customers. So for, uh, let us say, incubators in the tea hub, government has taken that responsibility that if your product is of, or, the, or your services of value and relevance to us, we ourselves become, will become the biggest consumer for you, biggest customer for you. So I'm very sure that uh, this model of promoting rural entrepreneurship can uh, work well in uh, different parts of the state. And I'll be very happy to formalize this partnership with Kakatiya Sandbox to start a rural uh, entrepreneurship incubator here in Nizamabad with you. All right, let's just give a big hand for that. And that's a great message for all the young people here. If you do, you know, formalize that kind of partnership with the government of Telangana, when we do, not if we do. I mean, just imagine the opportunities for each of you. Because at the end of the day, you, you are the people that are going to, you know, make it work. So, thank, thank you, Jayesh Karu. Fantastic. Um, you know, you just, uh, I was thinking about it as you talked about mentors. Please do check out a program called Navoda Yemi. Uh, there, you know, all the programs are important, but that's a relatively new initiative we started here. i have had great success in Hubli with it. How they, you know, work with the local businesses and, you know, help them scale. And a lot of it is built around, you know, uh, connecting and developing mentors. So with that, why don't I open it up for Q&A from the audience. Uh, you know, so please, uh, somebody to pass around the mics. Wow, a lot of hands. Okay. Just if you can identify yourself quickly and uh, tell us who the question is for. Uh, Annie has been prompting me. So how much time do you have, Annie? Oh, all right, thanks. Please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my question is to IT Secretary. Actually, I'm a student from engineering department. I'm doing my software engineering. So what are the innovative steps taken to like uh, develop IT industries in rural parts of Telangana? Like we are seeing a lot of innovations and incubators ideas are being developed in Hyderabad. So we like the entrepreneurs in local rural people does not get support. 
So do you really think that uh, things will work it out in uh, industries will come to Zappa district? See, <coughs> two things are uh, being tried out for the rural areas. One is we have a program which is called, uh, we have an institution rather, which is called TASK, the Telangana Academy for Skills and Knowledge. And TASK partners with uh, 170 engineering colleges and 140 other professional colleges throughout the state. And uh, I'm sure many colleges in Nizamabad are partnered with TASK. So what TASK does is to bring uh, the latest ready-to-market kind of technologies and tries to get the students studying in that, that college a flavor of those technologies through short courses, through seminars, through demonstrations and so on and so forth. So the idea is that the students in the rural areas also become aware about what are the latest uh, hiring trends, what kind of skill sets are being looked after, looked for by the, by the employers, so that when you go out and compete with, let us say, city students or even, uh, you know, the best possible academic institutions, you don't feel uh, inferior or there is nothing to say that you lack this knowledge or you are behind them in any way. So that is one intervention we do quite a lot for uh, rural students. In fact, not very far from here is the town of Basar. Chalamandi ki tel se utto te. Basar lo, oka chala binna maina sekshana samstha undi, dhani triple IT antar. Akra padav targati murti jayaga ne, akra students ni baalu, akra dakhila istaru. So aru samasra, akra unnara vidyartu lo engineering chadu taru. At akra admission test e mundalu. Akra prati mandalam lo, mana in the past, we have to select toppers in the past. So, in the past, we have to select toppers in the past. We have to do the triple IT in the past. So, we have to do the triple IT in the past. So, we have to do the triple IT in the past. We have to do the triple IT in the past. And we have to do the triple IT in the past. We have to do the triple IT in the past. We have to do the वाले इंटरव्यूज के वाले टॉपिक के वाले लोग रखने काल का इश्यूज होते भी वालों आपका इंटरव्यूज लो सारी का मार्टला डे वालों का तो आंता वाले लो आप में दारिया बोलते थे का तो कौन ता वाले लो इतना न्यू नेता पाव ना उन्हें दे सो टास्क द्वारा ये पुरे फर्स्ट ईयर नोची है स्कूल पूर्ति आप आ वालो ट्रिपल आई टी लेवल पर चेता रो आ समय हम नोची है वालो की रक्तकाल का कोचिंग की बड़ा बो कोटा विषय आते हैं बड़ा बो अभी नहीं जरूरत होती है रानो रानो चला मार्क मार को अपना कर पिस्ता होती है सो दिस इस वन इंटरवेंशन व्हिच वी डू फॉर रूरल स्टूडेंट्स एंड द सेकंड थिंग ऑब्वियसली � there are lots of opportunities for uh, students who don't have a very high kind of degree to get into these rural BPOs. But slowly, IT companies are moving towards uh, tier 2 sectors also. And Nizamabad, will, it will take some time, but I'm very happy to inform that Warangal is uh, emerging as a very important destination now. And uh, very shortly, you'll be hearing uh, from us, from our minister and myself, the names of three, four big companies who are actually planning to start their activities from Malaga. So once we breach uh, that barrier, that Anta Andhra Bhavo ne unko de, Andhra Bhai Tamilte me dorka do, manasatwani manu pagal chee galte, apnu kachitanga mundu varangal, tarvata Karimnagar, Nizamabad, Rano Rano, matlab rashtrani cover chee ramki akasha to. Alright, go ahead. Good morning, panelists. Uh, I am Kushal here. I study at Ajim Premier University in Bangalore. So, let's push along. So, my question is to both uh, Desh sir and Rala Jay sir. So, uh, Desh sir uh, running, uh, introduced a concept called Sandbox and a social entrepreneurship. So, uh, sir, uh, what is the support that is lacking from the government side? Uh, you doing it at an individual level, trying to promote social entrepreneurship. So, you might have faced barriers and constraints in terms of the government or the existing system which is not supporting you. Uh, and the question to Jay is, uh, what kind of a support system that you are expecting from the civil society? So a lot of us who are representing non profits who are running a different kind of enterprises, collaborate with them. How government and the both civil society can together work and create an ecosystem where we can promote the social entrepreneurship at a much wider scale. So, I mean, how we should establish a relationship with the civil society, the government of Telangana, or even with the government of India? All right, thank you. you you're an entrepreneur, right? So, you should expect nothing from the government. You know, 
know, I think we, we both have to think differently. If you're an entrepreneur, you have a conviction, you have a passion to do something, and you're going to do it independent of any hurdles, right? You're going to be a bulldozer. Because if they remove one hurdle, I can guarantee you that you'll have another 10 hurdles. So as an entrepreneur, you have to have a very different mindset. Now, Jayesh and Sandbox and so on, as ecosystem builders, we can think about it a little differently. We can say, okay, how do we reduce the friction so that you can be more successful? But entrepreneurs should never, never, never wait for anything else. You know, I think policy makers, sandboxes, we should make it possible so that a lot of people can play the game. And we shouldn't try to make one person into winner or loser, right? And sandbox, the main purpose of the sandbox is to create a living laboratory so that you can debug all these things. So let's say if you don't know how to work in the government, well, think of a small program where you can maybe team up with the government. And then you can do that in, let's say, Telangana Sandbox, Ubli Sandbox, Varnasi Sandbox, wherever. And the sandbox will help you work with the government to figure out it, if it makes sense for you, if it makes sense for the government. And if it does, then it's the job of the government to make that thing available to millions of entrepreneurs. So I think policy should be made by proof of concept. That is, entrepreneurs like you need to start working on things, debug the problem, make sure it works in one place. If it works in one place, let's make it work in two, and then four, and then eight. If you can make it in eight, then people say, oh, it's so obvious, of course we should do it. And then we need the government to actually take that and spread it to not eight, but 800, but 8,000 to 8 million places. So, I would say, you know, I think government is trying to reach out quite a bit, but they have their own, you know, problems, right? I mean, it's not something they can change overnight because they have to look after the whole population. So, as an entrepreneur, I think, let us know what your issue is. Together, we can find ways to sort of overcome that hurdle and then, and then you know, move on to the next step. So. So I, I'll, I'll quickly add to what uh, Desh mentioned. I fully agree with you that it has to be a partnership model. Government has some role to play and uh, obviously the civil society has to play certain other roles. In fact, Atlanti Sandarbamlo, Chala Mandi Adutaru, that it is a lot of work in the world. So, there is a lot of work in the Simple answer उन्हें ना simple answer है उन्हें ऐसे ही रोज़ जनाल मध्य लो प्रबुद्ध पैना अंतर नमक कम लेते हैं there's a loss of credibility so farmers दगर की व्यवसाय अंतरंगम वैली मेरो pesticides challenge मतो मेरो बैंड का ना टंडी अगर वैली चप्पता उन्हें वालो नवतर इतना इन्हें को चप्पता ना रो अ बैंड का है अम्मे वाला थी मतलब इतना मैंने मैंने कुमक का यारा आने के मैंने स्वार्थम होंडा अटलांटी पाते पंद्रह दिन प्रश्न आल उठाए सो आसान लो क्रेडिबिलिटी लेते हो सो आप पानी वाले दिन मोबिलाइज़ चेंडा मो वाले दिन ना मिंची बैठ के ना टेटा में मेरे को बेस्ट उन तुम दे अटला में मैं पढ़ो चेले बट मेरो वॉलेंटियर्स द्वारा आदि पड़ा स्थानीय कंगा उन्हें ट्वेंटी वॉलेंटियर्स द्वारा वाले निभागा प्रोत्साहन इंची वाले निभागा शिक्षण इंची इंस्पिरेशन इंची आकरे उंडी वाले तो प्रति रोज़ उस संप्रदेश को तो वाले के इतने टीवी शब्द चप्पता उन्हें वाले का चतंगा मर्सर रोज़ नो चाहे इतने टीवी अन्य वाले आचरण लोग कितने इसको रागल तो ना सो दिस काइंड ऑफ कम्युनिटी मोबिलाइजेशन I mean, if you want bed kai seeds, government can give you bags of seeds. If you want something else, that also can be delivered. So, delivery is good from the government, but government will never succeed in creating a strong receiving mechanism. And unless you have that, you may keep delivering hundreds of things, it will all be going like uh, down a bottomless well kind of thing. So, Rendu Sayuktanga Pani Chegal Tene, Apudu Nijabana Apriti Jarkundi, and Ade Namuna, Ade Udarnam. Thank you, Jayesh, and uh, yeah, I'm being told we are running out of time, so no more questions. But I just wanted uh, to request Desh for any closing comments for about 30 seconds, and uh, I just wanted to do the same.
Right. You know, I think it's, it's such a music to hear, uh, hearing from Jayesh about reaching out. You know, I think he has internalized exactly what the government is capable of doing and what they're not capable of doing. So if you look at the private sector, the big companies realize it too. The big companies cannot be innovative. So the way the ecosystem is created in the private sector is that thousands of entrepreneurs try something or the other. A few succeed and get angel funding. A few among the angel funded startups get the venture capital firm. A few among them will go public. The big companies which are looking for innovation always have the mergers and acquisitions group and they're looking at these experiments and they do M&A, they buy these companies, buy the organizations that actually are doing good work and, and inject innovation to the big company. If you look at the government, government is bigger than any big company you can think of. And therefore, I think what Jayesh is doing here is he is the M&A group for government. So it's up to the entrepreneurs to actually take the initiative, build the program, show that actually it really, really works. And if you can show that it works in one, two, three, four places, he can be sort of the M&A acquisition person who can then sh throw the lots of resources behind it to make it happen. And there's examples. I mean, for example, Akshay Patra, which a lot of you know, more than half the funding for the Akshay Patra, where we do 1.5 million meals every day, comes from the government. So it's a, it's a program that works together with the government. So I think it's very important for entrepreneurs, mentors, citizens, private sector, CSR, all of these people come together to really get this innovation process, experimentation going in a big way. And, and one of the things in a nonprofit is that the experimentation is a new phenomenon. Because if you are a nonprofit and if you go to some funding agency and say, this may or may not work, they'll never fund you. So the nonprofits always are used to pitching where they say, I do this and it's fantastic, it'll save the world, right? Because if they don't think it'll work, nobody's going to fund them. So we have to change fundamentally that culture in the nonprofit. Nonprofits have to be trying out new innovative things which have a possibility of failing. And that can be funded by CSR money, by different money, by, by lots of other agencies. But when we see something really work, we need Jayesh to come in and sort of help us spread that to a lot of places. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a great model and if we can all work together to make it happen. And ultimately, it's the, it's the millions of entrepreneurs. So, you know, the world needs 75 million entrepreneurs to really run the economy over the next 10 years. And India needs 10 million entrepreneurs to actually make things happen. So we should not think about entrepreneurship as just hardware, software, IT, uh, Snapdeal, Flipkart. There has to be entrepreneurship everywhere. Even IT can penetrate. So when they do better cotton initiative, when there's one person helping 500 farmers, we need a lot of those people and they need to be enabled with IT. Each one of them needs a tablet. Each one of them needs information coming at them, you know, being educated about new things, new science, new technology. So I think we have to think about a lot of the technologies that are coming our way so that they can benefit the rural population, the farmers. But we need the translators. We need people who can translate the science and the advances in technology to this population. And that's where I think all of us can play a role. Some of us can bring the technology. Some of us can translate the technology. Some of us can convey the technology. A lot of us can inspire people to wanting to do better than what they're doing. And so I think each one of us have a role to play in this ecosystem. And it's very, very heartwarming to see that within two years, we have such a room full of people from all of these stakeholders actually coming together and wanting to do things. And, and I have no doubt that, you know, when we meet again, we will see that multiplicative effect come together. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Desh. And, uh, uh, such sandbox models take root across India, across rural India, say 10, 15 years from now. 
I know Hooghly will always be remembered as the birthplace for this uh, model of innovation. But with your support and participation, it's my belief and hope that Nizamabad and Kakatiya Sandbox will be noted as the place where it actually blossomed and became a model for the rest of India to follow. Thank you. And let's just give a big hand to Desh and Jayesh once again. Thank you. Okay.